Welcome to our lecture on nationalism and music, and today we'll go into a little bit of the history of uh, music and how it's been, um, how, how national, nationalism is expressed in music um, in Europe and in America, with kind of focusing our attention on the post 9 11, especially the, the tribute to heroes um, program that you read about in your reading. Uh, I think it provides some interesting uh, ways of understanding how nationalism is modeled in our music and our performances and um, gives some things to think about as we go forward in terms of how um, appropriate behavior is modeled and, and, and dissent is maybe a little bit quashed in some, in some ways. So what is nationalism? The first thing I wanted to, to point out though is, is a quote by Richard Truskin that um, nationality is a condition and nationalism is an attitude. So um, nationalism really is a, a way of, of defining uh, who belongs and who doesn't really. It's a way of promoting kind of the interests of an imagined community or nation by defining who doesn't belong based on characteristics such as culture, language, religion, politics, ancestry. Um, this kind of definition of nationalism is uh, quite pertinent today as we have um, a lot of nationalist talk going around in, in political circles. Um, but I want to talk about the idea of what's an imagined community, really. Um, it's any anything that doesn't really exist. Like a nation is, is an imagined thing. Yes, we have it as an Americans, we have kind of a land mass we call America, but really what binds us together is this, uh, is this kind of idea that we are Americans. It's an imagined community. Um, and what characteristics you base your nationality on uh, completely depends on where you are and the kind of the goals of your of your nationalism. So it, we have many um, nationalist projects out there in the world. We have places like Israel that are more based on a homeland for the Jewish people. We have other uh, many other countries, nations around the world that are based on um, ethnicity, on ancestry, on language and culture. And many nations that are, are kind of a, a mixture of all of these things, depending on where the borders were drawn, especially after colonialism. So you have many nations in Africa that have many different cultures, different languages, etc. cetera. Um, uh, that, so nationality really depends on where you are and how you define it. Um, it can be a kind of a force for positive force in terms of creating something positive out of, out of kind of chaos, uh, or it can be used as really a, a negative force as well. Um, yeah, and so you have many symbols. We've talked about the symbols before uh, about uh, promoting national ideology. Some of the American symbols we've talked about, you know, the flag and the Statue of Liberty and uh, the idea of progress and kind of the idea of kind of civil religion or in, in how God is with uh, in, in kind of mentioned and or referenced in many um, points in America. Um, and I would just define the difference between nationalism and patriotism because they're oftentimes used interchangeably. Um, and I just think maybe the difference for me at least is nationalism, is nationalism is more about defining who belongs while patriotism is more about celebrating that belonging to the group. Um, and so I think it's uh, important to maybe make that slight distinction. Um, so I want to step back for a second before we start talking about American nationalism, and I want to give you some kind of history of, of music and nationalism, and really the place we have to start is in, in Europe, because really in the 19th century there were a lot of national projects uh, in music, and the way they promoted kind of national interests um, really uh, was, was started in the, in the in 19th century and then continued on through. Um, so I thought I'd give you two two really good examples of, of nationalism in music. And the first one I thought you should listen to, which is linked below uh, this lecture, is um, by Mili Belakirev, who's a famous Russian composer. He's one of the kind of five famous Russian composers, along with um, Rimsky Korsakov and uh, other, other guys. Um, but what he does is um, oftentimes in these national projects or national music projects, they include folk music, they also include kind of national mythology and, and they reference the, the religion and our language of the area. And so I think maybe you could just listen to a little kind of a, maybe the probably the most nationalist Russian composer, uh, Balakirev. Um, I'll give you an example there. Maybe skip to about minute 220 um, and listen for about a minute. You can hear the use of really, uh, very strong use of Russian folk music in his overture. So pause the video, take a listen to that and come back. <laughs> 
And I think it's a, a great, a, a, Balakirev's overture is, is a great example of how in the incorporation of folk music idioms in an orchestral um, in an orchestral genre, really. Um, the other example I think I gave you is um, Richard Wagner's um, Ride of the Valkyries, which everyone probably already knows um, immediately, but you can pause and listen to that for a second. And really what he's doing, what Wagner does in a lot of his orchestral and opera pieces, he's not only referencing kind of the mythology of German people and kind of a general Aryan mythology, um, but he uses the language, he uses references to religion, sometimes he uses these kind of horn choirs as kind of a symbol for um, for kind of the German Germanness of his pieces. Um, uh, so that's again a, a good example of how European composers have had have used um, music in promoting kind of a national a sense of, of a sense of who uh, their nation is really. The, in the Russian case, um, a lot of the composers were kind of reacting to the, the dominance of the German uh, composers over orchestral and opera. So if you think about the first people who come to mind, if you think about orchestral and opera pieces, are you know. Um, Beethoven, Mozart, Bach, Brahms, these are all German. They really dominated the scene. And so when you get to the 19th century and these Russian, 19th, 20th century, these Russian composers are reacting to that and trying to in, trying to bolster their own sense of, of who they are and what their music sounds like. And so they, they include a lot of folk music mythology, religion, and language as well. So I thought we should move on to some uh, American musical symbols of nationalism. And I got a couple examples here for you. Um, we talked about in a previous lecture, the kind of use of the major arpeggio as the kind of musical embodiment of peaceful, prosperous country. Um, you oftentimes hear in, in many pieces that kind of evoke America or America. Um, so that, that major arpeggio is, is present in, especially the Copeland version of the Lincoln portrait that's linked below. Um, but unlike uh, the European counterparts, American composers really couldn't elevate the native music of the country. I mean, the Native American music would have been uh, scandalous if they had elevated that. And even if they were promoting kind of African-American musical genres that originated in America, they did so in a kind of a roundabout way. And so they would include jazz and, and spirituals and blues and, and ragtime, but in a, it, would, it would kind of be couched in this more, um, be used maybe like maybe not quite so obviously as uh, as some of the Europeans would use their folk music from their countries. Um, so I've got a couple um, pieces linked below. The first one would be um, William Grant Still's Afro-American Symphony. So pause for a second and, and listen to that for a minute or two and then come back and we'll talk about it a bit. So I think hopefully you enjoy that. It's a great piece of music. The great, um, it's really kind of a milestone in American music. It's the first um, symphony you know, uh, composed by a black composer and performed by a major orchestra. Um, and it really blends jazz, blues, and spirituals into this kind of classical form. Um, well, I think other composers at the same time, like Gershwin might have elevated jazz a little bit in their pieces. Um, uh, I think it's interesting that William Grant still is using the blues, which was kind of seen as a lower class or kind of vulgar music, and he's incorporated that into his symphony as well. So he's elevating a real, um, uh, interesting and w interesting way of elevating kind of African American music in his in his um, symphony. Um, I think he 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 couches his symphony. He, he writes the symphony as you saw that you know the, each each movement's titled with traditional classical names like adagio, moderato, animato, and lento. But in William Grant Still's notebook, so he gives alternate movement titles to these these, um, the movements of the symphony, such as longing, sorrow, humor, and aspiration. And I think it's uh, speaking to kind of a, a, a shift in, in uh, kind of the, the European classical idiom in terms of William Grant still promoting kind of a more of an American sound. So I hope you enjoyed uh, Still's Afro-American Symphony. And even just in the first few minutes or minute or two, you, you hear that kind of bluesy sound, which is really interesting to hear in a, in a symphonic work. Um, the other example I gave for you is Aaron Copeland's Lincoln Portrait, and we've heard a bit of Copeland's music before in terms of discussing the kind of Americanness. But I thought you should listen to the Lincoln Portrait for a few minutes, and then come back to this lecture, and we'll unpack it a little bit. So um, I think this is again classic Copeland, and that classic American sound of kind of evoking wide open spaces. Um, if you listened on in the Lincoln portrait, uh, Copeland uses a, a material that are from speeches and letters of Lincoln, and there's a, there are 
he also quotes some original folk songs of the period, including um, like Camp Town Races and Springfield Mountain. Um, and this was written in 1942. But again, you get this real, uh, really um, classic American sound. Again, the use of kind of this major arpeggio, the kind of wide open spaces sounding in Copeland's music, and the kind of use of uh, quintessentially American, um, the American president like Abraham Lincoln. So I think these are great examples of kind of earlier on how nationalism was, um, or the American nation was sonified or made into, or kind of brought forth in music. Uh, again, using the idea of a, a melting pot of different musics put together, and also this use of African American genres in, in some sense, uh, and also the use of kind of the major arpeggios, that, that wide open spaces, the idea of progress and possibility that is so distinctly linked with the American, American nation. If you recall from your reading, I think one of the interesting points uh, that is brought up is the idea of social modeling. And I think it's important to kind of recall this concept as we move forward in terms of talking about American nationalism post 9-11. And so I put up a few, few pictures here of how, and I want you to ask yourself, uh, how America and Americans modeled behaviors uh, called for by the circumstances of the time. And so you have how were how is American behavior modeled in um, music and film and TV and really and how regular Americans model this behavior in real life, how they model their behavior uh, under during the kind of Red Scare time, uh, during the kind of Cold War time, and then also post 9-11. And so there's different ways that Americans really uh, acted and, and, and tended to kind of create them, their American uh, nationality uh, and the ways they acted. So during the, the Red Scare, you know, this kind of fear of communism, there was a lot of um, optimism about the kind of greatness of America, that America was a, a, a nation under God, while as a communist were not. And we talked about this again a little bit before. Um, there was also the, a sense of, despite this kind of great sense of progress and prosperity, there was this underlying sense of fear. Uh, and so you had Americans building bomb shelters in their backyard because there was this worry about the kind of nuclear uh, destruction that was that was just around the corner. And you can see that maybe in the, the cartoon in the center of your, your screen. And you can also think about, and we'll talk about a little bit more in the next few slides, think about the ways Americans modeled their behavior or what was, what was conceived model, what was uh, understood as acceptable behavior by Americans after uh, the terrorist attacks of 9-11. And we'll go into that again in a, in a few slides, but uh, keep thinking about this idea of uh, how behavior is modeled on TV, how it's modeled in music, what's considered acceptable. Uh, and I think you'll find uh, some interesting things. You'll, you'll, you'll encounter some interesting um, you know, ways Americans act and behave uh, in, in today and also looking back through history. So one of the first things I want to talk about, you know, post 9/11, is the kind of which was mentioned briefly in your article in the your reading, uh, was the the ban or quote unquote ban, or the kind of discouraging of uh, over 150 songs um, after 9/11, and I think it's a really interesting uh, interesting way of understanding how what Americans or what a, a subset of Americans thought was appropriate to be uh, for people to be listening to after such a tragedy. And if you go through the 150 plus 160 songs, uh, I think you'll find some, you know, you'll find some, you know, banning of uh, certain songs that are, you know, kind of promoting or not promoting, but at least talking about violence, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But then you have these really odd bands like Peter Paul and Mary's Blowing in the Wind or Cat Stevens' Peace Train. John Lennon's Imagine or James Taylor's like Fire and Rain. So a lot of the titles, a lot of the songs were actually banned just because of they had the word fire in the title, which is it seems like an extreme knee-jerk reaction by, you know, program directors at Clear Channel. Um, and I think also what you'll find is uh, this also a, a banning of songs that are promoting the idea of peace over war. And I'll, I'll give you examples in the next slide here. But I want you to think like, what does it mean? when the, the, the judgments, these kind of shaky judgments of Clear Channel program directors and ordinary people and politicians try to shield uh, or tried to shield the kind of what a quote unquote fragile American psyche from the songs and titles that were 
um, that engage with you know complex social issues and political issues, um, or even just type titles that have you know words wind or fire, um, or titles or songs that even promote peace over kind of retaliation. Um, I think it's a fascinating thing to think about, and we'll examine a few songs here uh, in the next slide. So I gave you three examples here, and um, the first one uh, I think you could pause and listen to is James Taylor's Fire and Rain. Uh, it's a really very nice song uh, from the 70s, and it has nothing to do with <laughs> terrorism or um, uh, violence or anything. I think, so pause if you haven't heard it before. Great song, listen to him playing and, and singing, uh, and then come back and we'll talk about it. I think what you what you maybe if you listen to James Taylor's song, you realize that it's a it's a song about longing and and love, etc. And the really the only reason it was possibly banned was this idea that it had the fire in the title, and that's fairly um, uh, that would be fairly uh, I think not the best reasons to ban a song, I guess. But a lot of people were reacting very uh, strongly to the terrorist attacks on 9-11, and so James Taylor's song was encouraged not to be played on these Clear Channel stations. And if you didn't know about Clear Channel, it's, it's a big conglomerate that owns most of the radio stations in the U.S., and so what they, what Clear Channel does is what you're basically what you're hearing on the radio. Uh, pause for a second and listen to John Lennon's Imagine, not only because it's a great song, but um, also think about why was this song banned after 9-11 on Clear Channel. So um, I think you probably got the idea after listening to Imagine that it's not uh, in any way, it doesn't have any word, the words fire or rain or something, words that might be, um, you know, uh, disturbing to the fragile American psyche after 9-11, but it's a song that's actively promoting the idea of peace and kind of imagining a new world. And I think that speaks to um, one of the important things about um, American nationalism post 9-11 is that uh, the acceptable behaviors weren't the promotion of peace. The, the, the social modeling wasn't about promoting peace and forgiveness, etc. It was about coming together and uh, eventually achieving retribution. Um, so that's a, it's, a, it's a pretty strong, um, uh, very kind of a very spe specific way of, of behaving and thinking and about the American nation after 9-11. And Lenin's Imagine just obviously didn't fit that narrative, so it was uh, it was um, you know quote unquote banned by Clear Channel. And the third example I think you should listen to. It's also a great piece of music. It is in itself a little bit more controversial. Uh, this is Rage Against the Machines uh, Testify, and actually all of Rage Against the Machines songs were banned. The entire their entire catalog was banned by Clear Channel after 9/11. Um, and once you listen to that again, uh, it's a it's a more controversial than the first two, and I'll know what you think about what you're what you're hearing. And so, after listening to um, Rage Against the Machines testify, I think you could see maybe why, um, maybe more not more reasonably, but maybe why again all their songs are banned. Their Rage Against the Machine was much more uh, politically uh, controversial. They were active. They were basically in testify. They were equating. Um, Al Gore and George Bush as, as the same. They were just this, this basically the, saying that there was no choice in the, in the politics in America, that everyone's the same and thinks the same thing. And the real problem is that people have no choice. And I think that's, you know, a little bit controversial to say. Um, and especially after 9-11, um, when the country is trying to pull together, um, trying to make sense out of a, a big tragedy, um, dissent was actively suppressed. And we'll see that again in another slide, another another song in, in, a, in a little bit. But I think it's worth thinking about uh, how dissent is um, uh, suppressed after certain events and what it says about uh, American nationalism and the American psyche, I guess. So let's move on to um, the kind of the focus of the lecture today is on the post 9-11 modeling of American nationalism. And I give you a couple examples from the Tribute to Heroes concert that happened a few days after 
or a week or so, a couple weeks after uh, the 9/11 terror attacks. And if you don't remember very clearly, the whole country was basically shut down. No one was flying anywhere. It was everything was focused on the the terror attacks. And so this tribute to heroes was a big deal. It had um, you know, famous, famous uh, musicians, film stars, TV stars, actors, comedians, etc. And this is a long program, uh, supposedly raising money for um, you know, victims and our first responders of, of 9-11. So I think we should watch um, Bruce Springsteen um, performing. Uh, he's the first act they performed in the Tribute to Heroes uh, program. So once you watch that, note not only the, the song, the lyrics, but also the visuals that were discussed in your article and come back and I'll kind of recap what you saw. So it's a great song. Uh, it wasn't written for 9-11, if you recall from your article. It was a song written that Springsteen had written for um, to kind of revitalize Ashbury Park, New Jersey. Um, and it was repurposed really kind of for this uh, New York City um, post 9-11 you know, fundraiser. Um, I think Springsteen as the kind of lead act in the Tribute to Heroes this really speaks to his fame as a, giving a voice to um, kind of like working class America. And as also noted in your article, I think there, you look at the visual setting, there's candles, there's, you know, muted, it's kind of darker colors with, uh, with um, oranges and blues and all of these things are basically um, creating an atmosphere um, that kind of displays that type of religious nature, that civil religious nature we've talked about before that kind of displays the kind of Americanness as also caught up in the idea of religion. Um, I think you saw uh, Springsteen performing, you saw his backup chorus also performing, and they were very still uh, in their movements, they were very um, stationary. And I'll give you another example of um, that and a, a kind of a more of the movement um, uh, and the African American movement and body movement and how it might uh, be saying something uh, in the next couple slides. Um, before we go to that, um, the, the kind of movement slide, I want to actually, this is the movement slide. This is the uh, Faith Hill performing um, uh, for the Tribute to Heroes concert. So why don't you pause and listen to um, there will come a day by as performed by Faith Hill and her backup chorus and note again not only the lyrics and the music but the setting and the the backup chorus etc all these things and as discussed in your um, in your article I think you notice the backup chorus the movement the kind of physical exuberance they display and I think I would tend to agree with the, art, the authors of your article that they were um, the African-American body is used as this this um, way to release like overwhelming emotions through their physicality. And I think it's very different than what you saw with Springsteen. It's also very different from your other listening example of U2 performing from London. Um, so it's an interesting way how maybe race is modeled in the Tribute to Heroes concert performance and how kind of certain racial uh, stereotypes or characteristics are reinforced in this uh, in this performance. I think um, you obviously are getting the kind of religious overtones in both Springsteen and Faith Hill's uh, performance. Faith Hill's song is much more religious, but the setting is again this candle that setting uh, organ and kind of um, this kind of you know Baptist type church sound you're hearing from her song. And you get, um, you know, even in the lyrics of her song, you're getting her singing, saying, hold on to your faith. Uh, in this world we're living isn't anything sacred. Uh, there will come a day, every knee will bow, sin will have no trace. And I think this is a, a symbol, you know, a way of speaking about not only Christ's, you know, second coming um, to the earth, it's also con condemning the terrorist attacks, saying, you know, isn't anything sacred. And also, um, it's also kind of portraying an idea or a faith that God is ultimately on America's side, that you know, when God comes, every knee will bow, sin will have no trace, and so they'll basically be wiping off these, this sin of the, the terrorist attack. And again, this is a way in, in two, you see kind of two modeling, and two types of modeling in this, this clip. You have a modeling not only of the kind of, um, you know, the use of black bodies to, to mitigate overwhelming emotions through movement, but I think you also have this again modeling of America as a religious kind of Christian country, um, 
yeah, so that's a, yeah, I think a great, um, great example of that. I think two more things that I wanted to say before I move on is that also it's important to remember not only is it kind of racial modeling going on in this program, you have a lot of gender modeling, a lot of gender stereotypical gender reinforcements going on. So you was mentioned in your article that um, uh, male film stars, TV stars would come on and speak about the kind of heroism of the police and the fire department uh, during the 9-11 attacks. And while as people like Callista Flockhart or other female um, actors would come on and speak about the, the nurturing characteristics of teachers who protected their students during the, the terrorist attacks. And so again, you have not only this racial modeling, you have a gender modeling, a very stereotypical um, uh, heterosexual gender um, or conforming modeling going on in this tribute to heroes. Um, the second point I wanted to make is that it's also, um, these aren't, um, these types of modelings aren't done just willy nilly. They're, they're really thought about. Um, so you have in other instances during the tribute to heroes concert, you had performers like Wyclef John who performed and then you'd have uh, his performance followed up by a big film star that may be more um, well known to kind of the general American populace like uh, Tom Cruise. And so what the, all of these things being done are kind of with the purpose of keeping viewers kind of glued to their screen, even if their interest is, if kind of typical white suburban, you know, middle, middle class American in, in wherever in the middle of the country doesn't know what Clef John and his music, he'll be brought, they'll be brought back to the screen by by Tom Cruise, somebody that everyone knows about because of his fame in, in film. And so looking at all these these ways of modeling um, you know, not only gender and racial behaviors, um, but also kind of the, um, the, the kind of TV or advertising type viewer um, modeling going on to kind of keep your eyes glued to the screen. It's interesting to note that it is very um, thought out. This is not, um, again, this is not something that's happening um, in an ad hoc way, it's a very thought out, um, methodical process of um, creating a sense of American nationalism in uh, a TV or a television program. And so I wanted to move on to kind of the, the flip side of this. Um, I want to talk about the idea of dissent, um, political dissent after the, the terror attacks. And I think this is a great uh, example. Um, of something like like um, this political dissent, and this is Saul Williams' um, "Not in My Name" uh, and album. That's it's September twelfth is the song, and I think you should pause for a second, and listen to Saul Williams perform, and we'll come back and talk a little bit about his the idea of political dissent um, in a nationalist setting. So I think it's a great piece of kind of hip hop rap spoken word kind of um, performance there by Saul Williams. Um, and I think this was written a couple couple years after 9-11. Uh, and it's certainly the kind of thing that would have, um, right after the terrorist attacks, not been given, you know, license to play on Clear Channel. If they were banning things like, you know, um, Peace Train by Cat Stevens and, uh, um, you know, Imagine by John Lennon, they certainly wouldn't be playing Saul Williams' um, uh, piece of dissent. I forgot to mention, though, also that one of the reasons maybe why they were banning Cat Stevens was that um, he had converted to Islam. And so not only are his, his songs about peace and love and etc., he had converted to Islam and that was basically kind of demonizing him as a Muslim, uh, despite the fact he had, you know, obviously nothing to do with the terrorist attacks. But back to Saul Williams, um, I think it's a really uh, interesting piece of dissent that um, that attempts to establish a sort of unity in dissent. And I think he creates this, Williams creates this solidarity, solidarity as kind of gradually throughout his song. He uses kind of specific references and gradual development through the song. Um, his song begins with the kind of I, he uses I, two autumns go, autumns and I haven't changed enough. Uh, he uses kind of starts with an I and then, then moves to this sense of we. So he's building this, this sense of solidarity in dissent. Um, and he, by the end of, of, or the kind of middle of his song, he's arguing that 
that war is kind of a continual cycle of bloodshed and hatred and that America's seeking of justice and retribution will only kind of create this, this spiral of, of kind of hate-filled violence over and over. I think contrasting Saul Williams' um, song uh, with maybe Clint Eastwood's appearance on the tribute to heroes that you read about in your article is really interesting. I think how Eastwood is almost, in a sense, promoting this idea of retribution while Saul Williams is saying, you know, hold on, um, that's not the way, that's not the way I see it, and that's not the way I, I believe. And so I think I'm I'm highlighting all these songs really as a way to, not to 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 play down the tragedy at all, or uh, or say that the calls for community and togetherness are inappropriate. But I wanted to at least uh, lay bare, or at least help you understand some of the ways that politics, um, that gender, that race that calls for like military retribution, etc., are all caught up in this idea of promoting what is um, the American national response to 9-11. Um, I, I think mentioning Saul Williams' song, mentioning the Clear, Clear Chan ba um, ban on 150 or more songs, also gives you the idea that uh, it's not necessarily organic, but it's a, it's a political process that these, that the kind of American national social modeling um, is very much caught up in the ideas of race and politics and gender. So just to recap, we've gone through um, a few examples of how America models itself musically as a nation before 9/11, and how um, you know how maybe the national response to tragedy was modeled in the tribute to heroes um, performance. But I just want to recap some of the more important parts from the, from the lecture um, that. Historically, nationalism has employed folk music and mythology of ethnic groups or nations to kind of help establish this imagined group, this this nation that is um, that that helps establish who belongs and who doesn't. Um, unlike European counterparts, American nationalism really relied on this idea of the melting pot, along with borrowing certain aspects of American African American musical forms, um, and the idea is kind of this of, of progress of open space. To make it to to model American nationalism in music. Um, also, want to point out that American nationalism was consciously constructed after 9/11 to project a sense of togetherness, strength, purpose, to allow for um, uh, a sense that we that retribution was coming, and that also it was um, the American nationalism was pushing dissent to these ideas of retribution and war, it was pushing that descent down. It was actually actively pushing or making um, songs about peace, kind of being banned from the, from the radio and also not really playing much else besides this kind of um, uh, sense that, that retribution was, was coming and appropriate. Also pointing out that gender, race, and politics and television viewing habits were considered when framing the displays of an American national character, especially in the tribute to heroes. But really, if you look at all media, um, music, television, film, um, it, none of these things happen just you know be, just because they're all kind of thought of, they're modeled and in in some ways very stereotypically modeled. Um, stereotypical gender roles, stereotypical uh, racial roles are modeled uh, in American media. And finally, as I've been mentioning, uh, that dissent was really silenced and considered unpatriotic, and um, uh, wasn't wasn't part of the way it was thought appropriate to American model American nationalism. So, given all these things, I think it's important for us to kind of you know look through history and also look about um, how American nationalism is being modeled today. Um, so, no matter what your political persuasions are, there's a lot of talk about nationalism in America and American politics. And I would challenge you to go out and, and see, you can see the politics of nationalism, but also understand how that politics plays out in music. We've talked a little bit about that in terms of, in one of our previous lectures, about how um, the differences between Republican and Democratic presidential campaigns and their use of music. But I think I would encourage you to go further and see how American national character is modeled in uh, popular music and classical music, etc., and what it's and and what is being modeled.
our traditional gender roles being muddled, our traditional stereotypical racial, racial um, characteristics or attributes being modeled. Um, so again, use this kind of historical overview and go forward and look at um, contemporary examples um, and see what strikes you and see if you can kind of analyze the use of of music, of politics, gender, race, class, um, war, and peace in today's music. Thanks for listening.